today is from places around the world where, where I've had the uh, privilege of doing some research with some cool people and with some really cool uh, animals, some charismatic megafauna, the things that really sort of thrill us and, and uh, get us excited. But there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna start with acknowledgements uh, just so I don't forget them at the end. Um, a lot of this work, some of it's kind of close to wrapping up, uh, other is, is just starting, but I wanted to highlight some uh, individuals and funding organizations that have made it possible. Large group of people um, that uh, work with us uh, in Brazil, uh, specifically focused on, on Arapaima, which is a large fish species I'm gonna talk about today. Then I'm gonna switch over to crocodiles in Northern Australia. And so this was a long running project, probably over the last uh, 10 years or so that we've been We've been trying to understand more about uh, crocodile biology and some of its implications for ecosystems in that area. And then some newer work uh, that was just recently funded last year. Uh, so I'll just show you sort of uh, where we're headed on that. And that's associated with grizzlies uh, led by Doug Clark here at the U of S. Uh, and of course it's made possible by lots of other individuals uh, who are part of the team uh, that go in, uh, into the field with us, uh, have a good time uh, doing the sampling uh, in really, wonderful, uh, warm and tropical places. So the plan for today uh, is, first I wanna give you an introduction to the tool that I use most often in my research and that's uh, natural uh, isotope ratios, natural abundance stable isotope ratios. So I'll just briefly show you how those work, uh, how we use them to understand what animals eat uh, and where they've been, what habitats they've been using. Then we're gonna move to the uh, three case studies, okay? So those three particular animals, each of which I've posed as a, in terms of a conservation question uh, in line with the sort of theme of a wild e. call uh, seminar series. And so the first will be about arapaima. And here we want to understand this is an important fish and an important fishery uh, in the Brazilian Amazon. And so we want to know where, where, does, it get to, where does it get its food from uh, in, in the food web? And what might that mean for mercury exposure? So uh, mercury being a toxic element, um, people, when we eat fish, we get exposed to mercury. And so we often wanna understand where those fish are getting their mercury from. Then we're gonna move to the crocodiles uh, and understand this is a really, this is a, a conservation success story. Okay, so crocodiles in Northern Australia were near extinct um, in the 1970s. They were hunted almost to extinction. They were granted protection uh, from hunting. And since then, their numbers have taken off. And so we want to understand what, what's underneath that. Why, is, why have their populations rebounded so quickly? And then finally, talking about grizzlies. Grizzlies, we have this sort of interesting, perhaps climate-mediated uh, situation where grizzlies are expanding their range okay, into certain areas in northern Manitoba uh, and Nunavut. And so we want to understand what does that mean for uh, both the, uh, the prey, potential prey for grizzlies in that area, for people, uh, as well as uh, potential competitors. And so here's your uh, isotopes 101. And what I really want to do is emphasize, so these are ecological tracers. Uh, we're using chemistry and natural fingerprints, okay, to understand the diets and habitats of animals. And you can apply these in two ways. The first is at the, at the location scale. So within a given lake, for example, you want to understand um, whether your top predator is being fed by sources that originate with attached algae, okay, periphyton that grows on the bottom of the lake, whether it's originating in uh, leaf litter, okay, picture leaves dropping their leaves, uh, that falling down in the bottom of, of the lake, decaying away and, and uh, producing organic matter uh, for insects and other organisms, or maybe it's the plankton, okay. Often when we think of a, in our head of a lake food web, marine food web, we think of plankton at the base, and that's algae that's growing in the water column, okay? And so the way the isotopes work is we often map them uh, in dual isotope space, okay? So we have nitrogen isotopes on the y-axis, carbon isotopes on the x-axis, and the first general rule is that the closer a uh, consumer is to a source in that isotopic space, the more likely it's reliant on that source, okay? And so in this case, we would say these particular small fish are likely being fed uh, by a mixture of plankton and insects, okay? Whereas over here, these larger fish, because they're closer in, in that isotopic space, they seem to be more reliant on benthic algae, okay? So that's sort of a general rule. You are what you eat. 
There are some offsets, okay? So it's not, not a perfect match, right? But we have ways to uh, account for that because we know from controlled rearing experience, uh, experiments, the general relationship between an animal and its diet, okay? So if we measured your tissues for stable isotopes, we could sort of estimate uh, what your most common food items were, okay? Whether you're a meat eater, for example, or a vegetarian. So that works at the site scale within a lake, within a river, et cetera. But then we can also scale up as well. And this is where I think the isotopes are, become really interesting. And that's because within a given habitat, you have, might have variation, okay? But you also have this regional variation as well, okay? And so this example is from uh, a river in Northern Australia that floods every year. It only floods for about two months, okay? So the floodplain is only available for about two months of the year. And what happens is if you go out and collect animals, so invertebrates and small fish out on that floodplain, they have a very distinct isotope ratio compared to the permanent habitats in the river, okay? And also compared to the marine environment. So this is a coastal environment. So you can imagine then now, if you have an animal that might range over all those areas, it might feed in the floodplain, it might swim out into the ocean to feed, it might spend time in the river, the permanent uh, water in the river, then it's gonna map itself onto this habitat, okay? So we have the variation within a, within a habitat and then variation regionally. And so just to show you a quick example, a bit of an older one um, of where we applied this method. So those are those same sort of source uh, habitats available for this fish called the barramundi, really popular if you eat fish and chips in Australia, this is what you'll get on your plate. And what happens is if you catch those barramundi in different places at different times of the year, okay, what you see is that the, each of these points is an individual fish, okay? What we see is that uh, the floodplain accounts for about a third of the diet of that fish, okay? Even though that floodplain is only available for two months of the year or about 16 or 17% of the year. So what that tells us is that the floodplain is disproportionately important to the diet of that fish, okay? And this now has conservation implications, right? Because often what we do when we develop rivers, we build dams and levees, we cut off the floodplain, right? And the floodplain is no longer available. So this shows that the floodplain is particularly important for people that like to eat fish and chips, okay? So every third bite comes from the floodplain. So that's the way, that's the, way the isotopes work and how, how I'm gonna show you uh, in these applications for our, our case studies. And we're gonna go to three places, okay? We'll start in South America, uh, in Brazil, in the Amazon, then move to Northern Australia for the crocodiles and then finish back closer to home here in cold Canada. So the first uh, case study then, so we're here in the heart of the Amazon, okay? So this is unbroken rainforest. Um, it's a pretty special place if you care about biodiversity, uh, highly recommend going somewhere like this. It's pretty spectacular. The river that we work in is called the Jurawa River. What you can see is that it's got all these meander bends, okay, through the forest. And what that does is it leaves behind these oxbow lakes, okay? Over time, eventually these lakes get cut off uh, from the river. And so these lakes then, they're still, they're, they're there and they, they'll actually reconnect to the river every year. So we have this very consistent flood pulse, okay? So the fish and all other creatures, river dolphins, et cetera, otters can swim into these, uh, into these lakes uh, back and forth for, for a period of time while the river's uh, in flood. And so those lakes are, are very productive, okay? So you work with, um, with villagers there, a village of 50 or 100 people on the banks of the Amazon. They get their fish from the lake in behind their village, okay? And they eat fish twice a day, okay? So it's amongst the highest fish consumption rates uh, in the world. Incredibly productive, you set a gill net and you have your catch in a matter of minutes. Okay, very much unlike what we experience here. And so within that catch, um, there's a special fishery uh, that's targeted at Arapaima. Okay, so these are river monsters. They can grow up to two meters uh, in length. Okay, one of the largest uh, freshwater fishes in the world, comparable to a sturgeon, uh, some of the bigger sturgeon species here in Canada, perhaps bigger. Um, and so these fish are actually um, not only consumed locally, they're also exported. Okay, to uh, markets within Brazil, um, perhaps beyond, not quite sure about that, but certainly when you go to Manaus, which is a big city uh, in the Amazon, you can find this species at the, at the market there. And so we wanna understand what's sustaining the biomass of, of this particular species. 
And so we worked with, um, with people who fish, okay? So this is um, not an indig indigenous population, but it's a, a population of people that have a very close connection to the river. And so they understand the ecology of the species quite closely. And what we've come up with basically is a list um, of all the different uh, fish species that are no known to be eaten by Arapaima, okay? So we looked in their stomachs and saw this. We did interviews and heard these species, and then these were the ones that were both in the stomachs and the interviews, okay? So we're pretty confident that, um, that these are the, the ones targeted by Arapaima. Importantly, they're all fish, right? So the, the, this species does eat some other um, uh, invertebrates when it's, when it's small, but once it gets big, it's eating nothing but fish, okay? So we know that fish are important for, for Arapaima. And because these lakes are, are very productive, uh, we might assume then that the, it's sort of the, uh, the plankton uh, that's, that's responsible for uh, this fish production. But what happens is when we look at the isotope data, uh, what we see is a mixture of sources, okay? And I'll just try and explain this, this plot a little bit. So each of these points, uh, different colored points up here are different fish species, okay? And we'll get, we'll get, get to that in a second. But then we have our three sources here, okay? So we've got zooplankton, which is representative of the phytoplankton, okay? We've got what are labeled as C3 plants here. So that's just leaf litter. That's just dead decaying leaves falling into the, into the lake. And then we have snails, which we use as our representative of that attached algae, okay? Picture a snail crawling along a log or something. It's grazing the algae that's growing on that log, okay? And so we have our three different sources here. And then we have this big cluster of points uh, which represent all the different fishes. And so one thing that we learn right away is that Arapaima are not at the top of the food chain, okay? So even though they're this giant fish, they're not, they don't have the highest trophic position. If they had the highest trophic position, their points would be up here, but instead they're kind of in the middle. They're these dark blue dots uh, in here. So the, the highest uh, fish species on the food chain you might imagine in your mind, what do you think of when you hear, when you imagine a voracious fish species from South America? The piranhas, right? So the piranhas are here. So even though the piranhas are this big and the arapaima are this big, the piranhas are actually higher on the food chain. Um, and we know that because they have this higher nitrogen N50 uh, value. So the arapaima are kind of in the middle, okay? So what they're doing is they're sort of um, picking up food from those different food source pathways. Okay. If they were reliant entirely on plankton, they would be a cluster of points all over here. If they were entirely reliant on the algae, they'd be over here. And if they were entirely reliant on the leaf litter, they would be much lower. Okay. And so they're basically forming a mixture. And we can use, um, use the math. Basically, it's Euclidean distance and uh, Bayesian mixing models that allow us to calculate source proportions. Um, and what we find is that the uh, uh, these arapaima are, are channeling those three different sources of energy, okay? So they're, they're getting fish that feed on the plankton, they're getting fish that feed uh, on the leaves, and they're getting fish that feed on the periphyte, okay? That doesn't mean the arapaima are feeding on these three things directly. They're feeding on fish that eat those things, okay? So this is the, the, the other thing the isotopes can tell us. It can help us trace all the way back to the bottom of the food chain, okay? And so when we do the calculations, uh, we, these are mixing model outputs. And what we see is that roughly equal, uh, about a third, a third, a third um, of their diet from the periphyton, which is the attached algae, the phytoplankton, and then the leaf litter, except when we go into the wet season. Okay, so now imagine, so this is during the dry season when the lakes are disconnected uh, from the river. Now what happens when the big flood comes? All that leaf litter goes into the, into the lake it decays away at the bottom, it gets eaten by fish and ends up in Arapaima, okay? So during the, the wet season, the leaf litter becomes the dominant food source for that species, okay? About 60%. And we think that this is responsible for the high mercury concentrations that we see in Arapaima, okay? So when we measured their, their tissues, what, very typical uh, fashion here, the bigger the fish, the higher the mercury concentration. And so um, many of these concentrations are well above uh, recommended consumption guidelines, okay? So the consumption guideline is about 0.5. Uh, for regular consumers of fish, it's even lower. 
And so what we have is a situation where pe people in this region are being exposed to very high mercury concentrations. Okay? And we attribute that, at least in part, uh, to uh, this pathway, which basically goes from the leaf litter into these fish species that are detritivorous. Okay? They feed on that, that um, detritus, like these uh, armored catfish uh, and kerosens. And then the air pine eat them and get high mercury. Okay. So the, um, the plan then, uh, of course, we've, we've sort of uncovered this problem with mercury uh, in this system because you have high mercury in fish plus high fish consumption, which is a recipe for potential health issue in people. So we're uh, starting some um, more holistic nutrition work with the community. That's gonna start uh, in March, we hope. So I'm gonna be heading there uh, with a, a professor from pharmacy and nutrition uh, named Gord Zello. Uh, to work with our community partners and try and understand this issue a little bit better. Okay, so that's sort of the uh, brief Arapaima story. Now we're going to move to uh, to another tropical part of the world, a uh, slightly different setting, and that's northern Australia. And so here we're going to talk about uh, crocodiles, okay, uh, another uh, fearsome predator, uh, one that is actually quite dangerous. Um, and the region where we work is across parts of the North Northern Territory, particularly in Kakadu National Park. So this is a massive uh, wetland area. It's very seasonal. So you have a, a, a long uh, dry season with very little rain and then a very intense wet season, which is just starting now. So they're, when we're in winter, they, they're having their, their uh, summer wet season. Okay? And the rivers all flood uh, and produce these wetlands and then uh, contract back. It's more of a savanna landscape than the forest. Uh, on the Amazon, okay? And so the crocodiles, uh, as I mentioned, they were protected in the, in the 1970s. Um, and so by that point, uh, the best estimates are there were only about 5,000 individuals uh, left in the world. So this is a, it's the estuarine cro crocodile, crocodilus porosus. Um, and so it's mostly concentrated in, in Australia. There are um, individuals found in other parts of the, uh, that uh, Southeast Asian region, so around Indonesia, but for the, most of the, the population was in uh, Northern Australia. So hunted to near extinction. And um, once that protection was, was brought in, their numbers have taken off. So this is just examples from three different river systems showing that increase in numbers, uh, very consistent uh, across site. And to the point now where the population is um, up to about 100,000 individuals, okay? And this is actually potentially creating a problem because of conflicts with people, okay? So the conservation question then is what's underneath that? How is it that, you know, often uh, animals will be give, granted protection from hunting or harvesting or perhaps their habitats protected, but their numbers don't bounce back the way we might expect, right? In this case, they have. So we wanna understand better uh, why, why is that so? And so in this case, um, I'm going to sh just show, start with a, an example from one location. This is a, so in Australia, Oxbow lakes are called billabongs, okay? So same idea, we have this, this lake that um, connects to the river during the wet season and then uh, contracts back in the dry season. That's what it looks like. You've got crocodiles in there, uh, as well as a whole other diversity of species. And this picture uh, is uh, of my friend and colleague, Dominic Valdez. He's an American guy. So I went to Australia to do my postdoc. He came at around the same time. So you had a Canadian and an American out working in these uh, Northern Australian landscapes, which was kind of ridiculous. But, you know, now that I think about it, it would be like sending Australians up to the Arctic here with a shotgun, knowing that polar bears are around. So anyway, we, we went out and this picture, so I never got to do this, he did. I, I wouldn't have the, uh, the courage to do it, but this is a picture of him restraining uh, a saltwater crocodile. So you see the duct tape um, there. So basically they, they uh, lasso them, uh, pull them on board, um, tape up their mouths, and then uh, get, get a sample, a uh, tissue sample from them. And so we did that in collaboration with the, uh, with the rangers um, from Kakadu National Park who, uh, who apply sort of best practices for, uh, in terms of ethics uh, in handling crocodiles. So anyway, yeah, that's him in the middle of the night too, by the way, doing this. And so when we look uh, at our dual isotope space for that particular billabong, uh, this is what we see. And so we're starting here just with the small stuff. 
okay? So forget about crocodiles, big fish, whatever. Just thinking about little things like insects, crustaceans, et cetera, and small fish. And what we see is we have, just like our, um, our Arapaima situation, we have three potential food source pathways, okay? We've got the plankton pathway here uh, that starts with zooplankton. We've got the periphyton or benthic algae with, that starts with the epiphyte. So this is algae growing on plants, okay? And then here we've got the detrital, which, which starts um, at leaf litter as well as a, a bit of this, uh, this dead sort of macrophyte tissue. And what you can see is we can kind of separate out uh, into those three kind of compartments within the food web, okay? So the little stuff is kind of splitting up the food web uh, fairly predictably, okay? But the reality is in this system, we also have these external sources. And this is now where we need to scale out and, and think about what else is out there beyond the boundaries of just the, the billabong, okay? And so to do that, we went back in the wet season and we, we um, went out on the floodplain um, to, uh, to collect organisms, okay? And so each of these points is a different uh, plant or animal that's out on the floodplain, okay? Right next to the, this bucket billabong. And you can see isotopically it's distinct, right? So it forms a distinct cluster. And then we also have the marine environment. So here we, we, um, we worked with, uh, we were lucky enough to work with commercial fishermen who provided us with samples of things like sharks and rays, okay? So that we could estimate the sort of the marine signal, isotope signal. In fact, um, one of the people that did that was a suspected murderer, um, which is a story for another day. So, the only time in my life I've ever actually spent time with someone who presumably killed someone. But you take your samples, how you can get them, right? So, so we have these five different food sources available for big animals, okay? So you imagine now you're a crocodile living in, caught in bucket billabong, right? You have not only the local sources available to you, but also these other ones that, that come and go uh, depending on the time of the year. And so now we can look at the bigger, bigger animals. And here's where the, the bigger animals fall out. So these are all animals that were caught in bucket billabong, okay? So a bunch of them are actually outside of the space of those, those uh, internal sources, right? So it basically tells us that the floodplain was really important for several of these species. And so that includes barramundi, like I showed you before, that fish and chip uh, fish, uh, as well as uh, Scleropages jardinii, which is a, a Saratoga, um, one that I hold close to my heart because of its name. And then we also have the, the estuarine crocodiles. So here's our crocodiles. They're kind of sitting outside um, of those local sources as well, suggesting that the floodplain is probably important to their production, okay? So again, this was months. They, these were caught months after the floodplain came and went, okay? So the crocodiles are, are fairly disconnected. And so what we can think of then is what's the mixture of, of sources uh, contributing to crocodiles? We know, for example, that they'll take marine prey. Okay? They'll, eat, um, they'll eat turtles, they'll eat uh, sharks and rays. Uh, so we know that the marine source is coming in. We know they eat things like barramundi, so that's a, uh, very much a floodplain signal. Uh, we know they, they'll eat cane toads, so the invasive cane toads as well. But we were left after this first sort of initial round uh, of isotope work with a, a big gap. Okay? So there's, because the, the crocs are positioned here in isotope space, it means there has to be some prey item out here in order to make the mixture work, okay? And we didn't know what that was initially. And so what we did um, as we, we tracked this further, we, uh, we found out uh, basically what some of the observations were, um, okay? So again, working with the rangers, the rangers often get to look in the stomachs of crocodiles, okay, when they're killed for various reasons. And so this table shows you different crocodiles that were killed and their stomach contents examined. And I'll give you just a second to look down through that list. Perhaps a chill will go up your spine. So what do you think our missing source was? If you thought humans, you're all psychos. So they do, uh, sadly, they do eat, kill and eat humans occasionally. This list, of course, is going to be biased because a crocodile is most likely to be killed in its stomach inspected if it was suspected of killing a human, right? So this is not a representative list, but it can tell you a lot about what, what these crocodiles might be eating. 
And two, two that uh, stuck out to us were uh, wallabies, okay? Wallabies and kangaroos, they go down to the water's edge and they become prey for crocodiles. And then invasive pigs, okay? Feral pigs, huge problem in Northern Australia. They're everywhere, okay? And they're also kind of semi-aquatic, right? They root around in wetlands and along water's edges, and as a result, could be potential prey for crocodiles. And sure enough, when we got our hands on samples of those different uh, terrestrial mammals, so the pigs and wallabies, as well as buffaloes, which are, are also um, invasive uh, in the region, introduced, they fit into that, that exact isotope space that, where we would expect okay, for, to fill out the rest of the crocodile diet. And so this becomes even more evident when we use a triple isotope approach. Okay, so in this case, the, um, the, gray, uh, the gray diamonds are all the crocodile, individual crocodiles from two different rivers. The red dots here are the terrestrial mammals that I just showed you. And so what you can see, especially here in the South Alligator River, all of these points are really pushing down uh, very close to the, that terrestrial uh, isotope signal, okay? And so when we do the mixing models, we, we estimate about 70% of the crocodile biomass is actually not aquatic at all. So even though they're living and breeding in the, in the water, they're actually taking mostly terrestrial prey, okay? As opposed to the fish that are swimming, swimming around them. And where this became even more interesting was when we looked at, uh, we got our hands on some historical, some museum specimens of crocodiles back when they were very, in very low abundance, okay? And when you look at those, those historic crocs, so these are from back in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s, isotopically, they're actually a fair, quite a bit different than the contemporary ones. So the ones, the modern ones are the ones I just showed you that seem to be feeding on these terrestrial sources, whereas the historical crocs are, are, are more uh, towards a marine source, okay? And so what that implies then is that this recovery uh, has been, uh, there's been a, a diet shift associated with that, that recovery. Okay, and we think it's pigs. We think pigs are, are really driving this. When we published this um, earlier this year, uh, some of the news organizations picked it up. Um, you know, who, like, who doesn't like a good uh, pig story? I especially like this, uh, this headline, Swine Dining. Uh, and so it's, um, it's kind of a conundrum, right? Because we have this invasive species, the feral pigs, that seem to be supporting the recovery of a really important iconic. Uh, Australian species. So how do you, how do you then manage that uh, going forward? And so it turns out it's a lot of pigs. So when we, the, the thing we're working on now uh, are sort of bioenergetics models to understand how much prey would be required in order to support such large crocodile biomass uh, and the gain in crocodile biomass. So the way what's happened, we've gone from, you know, less than two crocodiles per river kilometer up to about five, okay? Some of these are very large crocodiles. As a result, a huge increase in biomass, crocodile biomass, okay? Several hundred kilograms of crocodile biomass per kilometer. Those crocodiles need to eat, right? And so here's the, the estimates of the amount of protein they would be that, that, that would be required to sustain uh, such crocodile biomass. And we've started to do some back of the envelope calculations because these numbers seemed huge and seemed unrealistic that it could possibly be pigs or even other prey sources that would, would sustain such biomass. But the reality is when you crunch the numbers, it it's, it's actually becomes fairly reasonable, okay? So if we know roughly how, how big a pig is, um, that, that tells you how, much, how many pigs would be needed to be eaten, right? So 153 pigs per kilometer per year or three pigs per river kilometer per week, okay? So picture a kilometer of river, right? And imagine three pigs getting picked off by crocodiles every week. I think that's reasonable. And that's even if we assume the diet's entirely pigs when we know it's not. The pigs are only gonna be responsible for about 20% of the diet when we, when we use the isotopes to make those calculations, okay? Best estimates of pig densities um, are about 70 per wetland kilometer uh, in Northern Australia. And so, I mean, I've been out there they're, they're nocturnal species, these pigs. We could ask Ryan Brook about them. But you, you know, when, you, um, when you're out there, you see them in large numbers even during the daytime, which tells us that there are a lot of pigs 
in Northern Australia. Okay. Okay. So to wrap up, I'm going to just briefly show you um, this last example from, from Northern Canada. And in this case, uh, it involves the, uh, the expansion of grizzlies. Um, and so Doug Clark's been working on this question for, for quite a long time. He's actually recorded some instances where he's found grizzlies, polar bears, and black bears all, you, all in the same area. So a single camera actually capturing all three species in one location, which I believe is never is the only, the only instance of, of such a thing happening. The, uh, the area in question is northern Manitoba. And so you might think, well, the, maybe the grizzlies are moving north because of climate change, right? It's, it's, uh, it's warming enough now that they can occupy those habitats. Turns out they're actually the source populations from the north here, okay? Uh, because there are no polar bears uh, in, in southern Manitoba. Oh, sorry, no grizzlies in southern Manitoba. But you see increasing uh, frequency of observations. Best estimates are that grizzlies were, were present historically, but at very, very low numbers, okay? And so the, the, uh, they're not a new species. Um, so um, Doug working with, uh, with elders in the region, uh, you know, there is a Cree word, a swampy Cree word for grizzly bear, right? So that tells us that, you know, this is a familiar species uh, to people in that area. And so what we want to understand now is, um, is what are the implications, uh, both for the ecosystem and for, for people. So how are they going to interact um, with their prey? So certain um, prey species that might be important, like reindeer, for example, um, caribou. Sorry, the uh, if the, the grizzlies are predating uh, caribou, then that might might uh, become problematic for people. Uh, and then there's also questions about competition with other other bear species, uh, and then interactions with humans as well. And so. The starting point for us then, if we're thinking about uh, isotope work, is that we, we want to first understand, think about what, what could those grizzlies be eating, right? And so fortunately, there have been some observations. So this is uh, camera trap work showing predation on a goose, uh, goose nest, okay? And this has been documented fairly regularly. So we think that uh, geese might, might form an important component of the grizzly diet. The grizzlies, of course, are omnivores, right? So they're going to eat berries, they'll eat uh, might eat marine mammal carcasses, they might eat fish, uh, they might eat tubers, uh, fungi. So it's a, a really broad diet and it perhaps uh, creates one of the most, the, the biggest challenges uh, when it comes to applying isotopes. This picture here shows a polar bear uh, defending uh, a carcass of some uh, marine mammal from a, a grizzly. Okay, so this question then becomes, uh, might the grizzlies actually um, uh, usurp uh, some some prey that are uh, that polar bear would normally eat because apparently in Alaska, uh, where grizzlies and polar bears coexist, the grizzlies actually are the dominant the dominant um, competitor when it comes to these things. And so this is all the only data I've got to show um, today. So what I've been doing is is looking into the literature, okay, and what we see is some good news. There's good isotopic separation amongst different food sources, um, potential prey uh, and food items for, for these grizzlies. And so as we might expect, it separates out nicely. If you look in literature and find for um, different marine, marine birds, fish, uh, mammals, etc., very distinct isotopically from the, terrestri the potential terrestrial prey uh, for these grizzlies. And then we have freshwater limited data, but uh, again, suggesting uh, fairly distinct isotope ratios. And so we don't yet have grizzly bear um, isotope data from this region to map onto here. Uh, but we do know if you look in the literature, polar bears almost always fall way over here. So their delta 13C is usually around minus 16, minus 17. And their delta 15N is very high, uh, up around 20. So our polar bears will be over here. So it'll be interesting to see when we get, the, when we get some grizzly isotope data. Uh, where it falls on this on this plot to see if they, uh, even if some individuals might show evidence of of feeding on similar foods. And so we're working to get some uh, hair samples uh, in order to run for uh, stable isotopes. This picture, so someone gets the draws the short straw and gets to stick their head inside the the bear den to uh, to try and collect some hair. Apparently, this is a rite of passage in the in the bear world. <laughs> 
Um, and so, yeah, using different means, uh, whether it's um, uh, hair snags or, or other opportunistic collections, we're hoping to have some isotope data to be able to, to put on that map uh, and calculate uh, the grizzly diet in this region. And so with that, I'll, I'll leave you with a nice warm shot on this cold uh, November day. There is a crocodile in this picture, and so you see if you can find it. That's all. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, if anyone is in the room has any questions, I can run around with the microphone so that you can ask your question and everyone can hear you on Zoom. And then it, um, online, if you have any questions, you can throw them in the chat or you can um, unmute. Uh, just throw them in the chat. Actually, I don't know how we're going to do the unmuting thing. Um, and then Ilsa can read them out um, with the microphone. So any questions? <laughs> Okay, so for the crocodiles in Australia, your um, plots would start from when the conservation started, like, yeah. So has their population, like now that it's increased, has it exceeded their historical levels or just met that or below? Where is it at? Yeah. I don't think we know the answer to that uh, because there wouldn't have been proper surveys done prior. Um, but uh, certainly, some people are advocating that perhaps the population has grown too large to the point where they, they may need to start culling um, in order to reduce it. Um, like I said, most it's mostly because of negative, negative human interactions. So about two or three people every year die by crocodile uh, in, the, in that region. I've worked in, in lakes and billabongs where people have been killed by crocodiles. And um, so it's definitely like a, it's a, it's a, a human problem, right? Uh, in addition to a conservation problem. But um, I think, you know, I'd argue that people should just be more aware uh, and, and be safe, right? Because usually when people uh, get taken by a crocodile, it's often they're intoxicated and swimming at night, to put it bluntly. Um, and so humans and crocodiles can coexist in that region. Um, but yeah, it's hard to say whether whether those populations are above what they were prior to protect prior to and sort of depression by hunting you know i'm i'm curious if there's any uh, indigenous groups in this area that would have some idea or recollection of prior populations and curious if that's something you guys have explored at all yes yeah, so you're Specifically about the crocodiles here? Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. Um, in fact, I would argue that, um, so in the times I've spent in the field with indigenous people uh, in Northern Australia, they've been especially wary of crocodiles. And so if you think about the, <clears throat> the human history in the region, uh, indigenous people, somewhere between 40,000 and 60,000 years uh, of, of occupation of those, those territories, so they have a very long and abiding relationship with crocodiles, um, a respectful one. And some, some jokingly say a long history of mutual predation, right? So I would always trust their judgment on that. And so when it comes to conservation or, or thinking about targets for, for crocodile population si size, I would always lean on indigenous people to say, this is the, the appropriate number of crocodiles to be in the region. And so certainly Kakadu National Park has a very strong indigenous rangers component, uh, and they, they're the ones that, that manage those populations. Yeah. So uh, does the source, whether it's like hair or tissue sample or blood matter as far as the, the isotope ratios? And how do you, like, does, do the isotope ratios vary seasonally and how does that affect your analysis? Yes, question. So, so the answer is it does matter. Um, but mostly the, the variation amongst tissues would be much smaller than the variation like those dual isotope plots that I was showing you. So it's kind of, it, it's a bit inconsequential, but not necessarily. To your question about seasonal changes and turnover, absolutely. So the different tissues will turn over at different rates. Okay, so 
if you're working with birds and mammals and you draw blood, for example, and spin that blood down and you've got red blood cells and plasma, the plasma is going to tell you something about diet from the last few days, whereas the, the cells are going to be more several weeks. Um, in things like fish, we often use the liver, for example, as a faster turnover tissue, although it's still fairly equivocal whether, whether it is faster than muscle. Muscle tissue is, is most often used in fish or a fin clip if you want to uh, take a non-lethal sample. When it comes to hair, hair is, um, is kind of locked in, right? It's inert, so it'll, be, it, it'll represent the diet when that particular hair was grown. Uh, same thing goes for, um, for claws and other, other uh, inert structures. So there's a whole variety of, of different tissues that you can use to answer different questions. The populations in Australia has any effect on, um, I guess, the ecosystems that the or the rivers that the crocodiles live in. Like, do do you think there's a chance that because there's seventy, I guess I think you said seventy pigs per kilometer of, of river. Do you think like that's potentially dangerous for the habitats, like because they root near river systems and whatnot? Uh, so the. These feral pigs are a huge problem, uh, causing damage to wetlands. They also um, predate uh, sea turtle nests as well. So I've seen some pretty gruesome photos of a dead pig, cut, stomach cut open, and just picture little baby hat, turtle hatchlings, right? And just sort of scattered everywhere that were inside that pig's stomach. So they have huge, Australia has a ton of invasive species problems, right? Uh, cane toads, uh, many others, donkeys, camels, you know, you name it, they're, they're all there. Um, and so the feral pigs are, are one of the big ones. And so, you know, the fact that the crocodiles are picking them off, uh, I think is, is probably a good thing, but it certainly isn't limiting the feral pig population. And so they're going to continue to, to do damage to ecosystems. Yeah. I was just wondering, after looking at your stable isotope data for those crocodiles and the human remains, did you ever consider that this alleged murderer was actually that uh, the, he was killed by a, the guy was killed by a crocodile instead? So he is an alleged murderer, not not never convicted. Um, yeah, so it's it's hard to say. There's uh, there's a lot of violence going on in that region um, it's between. Uh, person to person and, and wildlife to person violence for sure. Um, going back to the Amazon, you said that you thought the mercury was coming from leaf litter. Um, why is that such a high source for it? Good question. It's not, it's not that litter is necessarily high in mercury. Um, but the, the habitat that the, um, where the, the leaf litter decays, uh, you basically end up with anoxia that can lead to um, sulfur-reducing bacteria very, being very active that methylate mercury and have it enter the food, food chain. And so it's, um, it, it's an interesting question because some, are, some people are currently arguing that leaf litter leaves actually do accumulate mercury, particularly in this region. Um, because there is a fair amount of um, gold mining uh, along the Andes, and that atmospheric mercury is then taken up by tree leaves. So we haven't actually tested the leaves for mercury in that area, but it's, it's definitely high on our list of, of priorities to compare concentrations in leaf litter with concentrations in algae, for example. Because normally I would expect um, that sort of terrestrial pathway to be fairly low in mercury. Uh, based on a lot of the, you know, my earlier work in, in Eastern Canada. Uh, I'm curious about what your predictions or hypotheses are about the grizzly bear and polar bear part, because you're kind of just starting it, right? And whether, yeah, about their diet, uh, either overlap or separation. Prediction is that there will be almost no overlap in diet. Uh, even though I showed you that picture of that grizzly, you know, taking a look at the that marine mammal carcass, I have a feeling that all of the uh, all of the grizzly points are going to be over here. But that's 
why we do the work we do, right? Maybe I'll, maybe I'm wrong. Did anyone spot the crocodile yet? Top left corner. Top left corner. Yep. I'm basking on the beach. Is there one there in the water as well? Right in the bottom there, a little tiny this one? This one? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so, but I don't think, I don't know, it's something, but it, if you look at the size, it seems quite a bit smaller. Could be. Is it okay if I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> Sorry to, to jump in. But yeah, no, we're just picking up on that last uh, topic. So one of the things I think is super fascinating is these kind of retrospective um, uh, analyses of, of isotope data and diet and that was really cool with what you saw with the crocodiles and i can see all sorts of applications for this so grizzly bears in alberta before and after feral horses um uh but also in the arctic um the polar bears say from 20 years ago to now i wonder if maybe you might have something closer to a terrestrial diet in that neck of the woods from what there was uh in in time before if you're looking out for that not just focusing on the the grizzly bears um i don't think you you might not have tissues of grizzly bears going back 30 years uh but for um for polar bears you would and if that might be something you might want to want to pursue i know I, i'm sure a few people have already looked at that yeah thanks for bringing that up so there there people have explored that question of course with you know climate change and reduced presumably reduce sea ice, might meet, force polar bears to feed more on land, right? And so it's reasonable to assume that perhaps they've shifted to a terrestrial diet. I've seen pictures actually of a, a polar bear uh, with blue, like purple, a purple muzzle from eating blueberries. And uh, that was given as an example of, you know, here's what could happen, right? Um, Keith Hobson and others, um, many of you probably know Keith Hobson, used to be in biology here, kind of still is. Um, He's done a bit of work on polar bears asking this question. And from what I understand in my limited reading, there's still, despite that anecdotal evidence for potentially increased terrestrial contribution to the diet, they're still dominated by, by marine prey to this point. I do have a project for you. So I was in Yellow and I looked up my old grizzly bear samples for there's maybe around 80 earplugs from uh, 1998 ish this would be before uh, these are barren ground grizzly bears um mm -hmm. uh before the bathers care when there was lots of bathers caribou and then after there's would be samples now mostly from like dna market capture studies but that's really neat the idea of looking at fundamental shifts in ecosystems uh or food chains from long-term reanalysis of of isotopes that was really cool what you showed for crocodiles yeah if you if you want to run samples we can do it i might just take you up on that <laughs> okay we have a question from the chat that i just thought i would read out it's from jacob and he says cool research my understanding of your arapima research is that you were expecting it to occupy the top trophic level but that the piranha occupied that spot did you look at any other large fish species that would rival as competing predators? I'm not super familiar with the fish of that area or on your list, but I do know there are larger catfish in the Amazon that might also occupy a top trophic level. Yes, good question. So there are other big fish species out there, things like peacock bass, for example, uh, as well as um, uh, arowana, which is actually related to the Saratoga. I told you about the um, the Saratoga in Northern Australia, which is my namesake. There's a, a related species in the Amazon called arowana, and it's actually right up there. So I'm just back on the slide here. So that's the green uh, points here. Um, so they're also above the, the arapaima. And uh, the, in terms of the catfishes, so there, there is that big sort of striped catfish, which I forget the name of it now. We didn't end up with we may have had a couple of samples, but they're not that common in the floodplain lakes. They're, they tend to they tend to move up and down the rivers more often. So it's possible if we had samples of those ones, we might have um, they might have shown up uh, right at the top of the food chain. But this really, um, you know, here in Canada, 
the bigger the fish you are, the higher you are on the food chain. That's kind of the rule, right? You think about a big pike or a big walleye, for example, big lake trout, uh, they're usually at the top of the food chain. In these tropical environments, it's not so straightforward because you have a lot more diversity uh, in shape. These piranhas, I mean, they're, um, yeah, the, they're small, but, uh, but they're pretty, uh, pretty ferocious. Uh, and so they can be at the top of the food chain despite having a small gait. It's really sharp teeth. The only other question in the chat is one that I think you touched on with one of the very first questions that was asked about the, the different tissues for stable isotopes. So I guess just maybe the second part of this person's question was, what is your preferred tissue type in, ter in relation to the issue of time frame represented that you touched on earlier? Yeah, so I, I usually stick with muscle tissue for fishes and that's because um, Oftentimes I'll, I'll pair this with contaminants work. And in that case, I want to know sort of a, a, a more time averaged indication of the diet of that fish, um, as opposed to just a short term diet switch, for example. So we want to understand sort of overall over a whole year of production, for example, what's, what's uh, responsible for the, the growth and, and contaminant exposure for that fish. And so I'll often rely on, on muscle tissue in that case, but oftentimes you know, it's, you only need this much muscle, right? And so uh, we're very mindful that we don't want to be killing fish just for the sake of a small um, plug of tissue. You can take non-lethal uh, muscle plugs. Um, most of the time we work with communities. And so whether that's here with Cumberland House, for example, in Saskatchewan or uh, in the Amazon, the fish is, is uh, being killed. We take our muscle tissue and then the communities take it uh, and, and eat it. And we often eat it with them, um, and and of course it's delicious. So, um, but yeah, we'll we'll try and avoid killing killing fish um, just for scientific purposes if we can. If there are no more questions, uh, thank you so much, Tim, for a great presentation. And we can give another round of applause. Um, and thank you everyone online for joining us. Our next seminar is next week, next Friday, and it is from Ryan Fisher on um, curating at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. <laughs> uh, so thanks everyone. Thank you.